<laughs> All right, it is 2.15. We're gonna go ahead and get started. This is Writing Lesson Plans Classically, and it's too late to leave if you're already in your seat. I'm Erica Mildred, and um, I believe that most of you were in my last session where I kind of did my big overview of who I am and so forth, so I'm gonna skip that part. Um, but if you're curious at the end, I'd be happy to share that again. Okay, today we are going to talk about um, classical tools for planning, what tools we have in our arsenal as we develop our daily and quarterly and yearly lesson plans. And then we'll um, talk about how we break that down into those courses or into our individual units or even individual daily lessons. We'll do Q&A and then hopefully we'll have some time to discuss and maybe even um, you can share with whatever grade or grade levels you teach and what you're trying to do. And, you know, we can either do that, um, the group and me back and forth, or even we can group up. We'll just see how the time uh, lends itself. I do see a lot of matching shirts. So maybe um, the last few minutes you'd like to get and powwow with your faculty and kind of talk about what you just have heard and how you may be able to implement it at your school this next year. Okay. So what classical tools for planning do we have? Well, um, as you probably have heard several times, at least today, we have the trivium and we have the quadrivium. Um, those are the seven liberal arts that serve us. Um, they are uh, subjects or areas of knowledge unto themselves, but we also can use the quadrivium and the trivium as methodological tools. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So we have grammar tools, we have logic tools, and we have rhetoric tools. And in the quadrivium, we have arithmetic tools, geometry tools, music tools, and astronomy tools. And I will say, and this doubles with, if you were in my last session, these methodological tools serve underneath the overarching seven liberal arts as content areas, okay? So we're not trying to say that these are more important than the content areas, but as kind of a secondary feature, we can use them as classical Lutheran educators. So we're gonna go through these one at a time, starting with the trivium, and let's talk about our grammar tools first. We will use grammar tools regularly for students in grades four and below. And you all know that just because we say regularly for grades four and below, some of you may have fifth graders that still are thoroughly entrenched in the grammar level of learning, if you will. Um, they aren't really making those dialectic reaches yet. And you may be a um, teacher of a classroom of, of third graders who are already asking the whys and the hows and trying to make those connections. You may be a parent of a toddler who is starting to try to make those connections. So this is just kind of a in general grades four and below, but please don't take that as an absolute. We will use the grammar tools for all students at the beginning of new subjects, concepts, units, lessons, et cetera. So even if you are teaching junior or senior high school, or even if you are teaching college, you still need to know your grammar tools. And when you're doing something new, you need to start there. Grammar tools, these are what, as grammar as a tool, this is what it's good for, or this is what it's good at doing for us. Grammar tools help us as teachers to drill and to repeat material. So almost like a toolbox, right, that a plumber or an electrician will walk into your house with, and he will know, looking at after assessing the situation, which tools he needs to pull out. You need to know that when you have material that needs to be drilled or repeated, you need a grammar tool or maybe a series of grammar tools to use to help effectively master that task. Unit and lesson plan foci when using grammar tools should be on facts, rules and exceptions. Anyone who teaches English, you know, the exceptions should probably be underlined. Uh, definitions and vocabulary, okay? But what subject matter doesn't have these things? None. What subject matter doesn't have vocabulary? What subject matter doesn't have definitions or rules or facts, right? They all do. All right. So here are some grammar tools. These are the things in your toolbox that you can grab to help accomplish these things with your students. Um, the first one is chants with or without music. Music. 
when you choose a chant um, with or without music, it really works well when the items are in some sort of succession or pattern, when order matters. So some examples of that are Shirley Jingles. Now, how many of you are familiar with the Shirley program? Okay, great. You need to know that when the Shirley program first came out, it was designed by two teachers, Brenda Shirley and her associate. I don't remember her name. It wasn't named after her, so I don't remember her. Okay, and these two ladies were educators and they were trying to figure out a method, right, by which to help students master grammar, especially like parts of speech and the functions that those parts of speech then do in a sentence and specifically a simple sentence. If you've looked at the Shirley program, they don't go any farther than the simple no. sentence, right? But they were noticing that, you know, their children would be taught what a noun and a verb was in kindergarten or first grade, and then they'd get to third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade. They're taught it every year, and you ask an eighth grader there, what's a noun? And they all look at you, they don't know. So they say, okay, the way we are trying to get them to learn these definitions and facts isn't working, and that's how they came up with the Shirley Grammar Method. Now, since then, it has been purchased, it has been marketed, it has been grabbed by the progressive community. Um, there are a lot of things in, in the Shirley program today that are really not necessary. There's a lot of extra stuff. I speculate because uh, 12 textbooks cost more money than one textbook. So anyway, please know that um, it, I'm not trying to advocate the entire system when I say this. I'm simply talking about the method itself right? Which, frankly, any of you put your last name there, you can write them too, mm -hmm. right? And you don't have to start with a simple sentence. You can go into the compound and you can go into the complex and you can go into the compound complex if your kids are older, okay? But the question answer flow, this is an example of Socratic method for at the grammar level, right? In the Shirley method, almost all of you raised your hand, but just for the few of you who didn't, in the Shirley jingles, what you do is you ask questions and then answer them. Actually, you teach the students to do this, to label parts of speech. So you ask questions like, uh, what is being said about, well, let's just do a sentence. Uh, the boy ran down the street. What is being said about boy? Boy ran verb, okay? Uh, down, they learn to identify prepositions, so they just say down preposition. Down what? Street. Streets. They get to object of the preposition. Then they label their article adjectives, adverbs, adjectives, etc. <coughs> the point is, is that that is a great example because there's some sort of pattern to it. Another example is Latin fist pops. Uh, Joanna Hensley, who now is, uh, she she was, she used to be at our conferences every summer when they were here in the States, but her husband is a missionary over in uh, Australia, so they are all there now. But she would talk about Latin fist pops, and this is really great too if it's, say, right after lunch, or say you have a bunch of squirrely boys in your class, or say it's just for whimsy. You know, there are a lot of different reasons. But she would take a verb and she would say, you would classify it, so it would be um, mo, um, mas, um, mat, um, mamas, um, matis, um, mont. Right. And if you have really squirrely kids, then you can like kick it or you can punch it in the air or whatever. Make sure they have space around them. <laughs> OK, but notice that that's another example of chance. But you have an order. Right. You don't get to just say the endings in any order you want. Other examples, I'm not going to sing it to you, <laughs> but you are welcome to Google it if you don't know what I'm talking about. But things like 50 Nifty, where you can say or sing all 50 United States in alphabetical order. Um, and kids can do this, as, especially if, how many of you work with preschoolers or youngins, right? They can do this. You don't need to save this till kindergarten, first, second grade. Your two-year-olds can sing in alphabetical order all 50 states. Pronunciation may be a little bit, you know, off, but that's okay. All right, uh, president sound off, all of these things because you have an order to them. Days of the week songs, months of the year songs or chants and so forth. Another one that I have as an example, okay, in case you all are like preschool, 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 subordinate conjunctions. Now, this chant um, that you are about to learn was made up by moi. So it's not in any book, but I am going to teach you a chant so that when you leave here today, you will know in alphabetical order, 21 subordinating conjunctions. Now, for my other group of you who were in my last group, 
you should be asking yourselves. Is it? But why yeah, why? Why are we doing this? Why do I need to know this? But this is really important, okay? Now, it's really important for all of us because we all speak the language of English, so we all ought to know the language of English. But especially for those of you who are trying to teach English and writing to your students, okay? Uh, how many of you love to teach all of the 28, 32, 47 I've seen rules of commas to your students? No. What if I told you I always taught my kids six comma rules? That's it, six. And then they would know everywhere to put a comma with just those six. Well, one of the ways I do that is by teaching them, having them memorize the subordinating conjunctions. So it's gonna take me just a minute, but I'm going to write them down and you guys can copy them down with me. Okay, 21 common subordinating conjunctions. Now, the reason, as you guys are finishing copying that, the reason I teach my students to memorize the 21 subordinating conjunctions is because subordinating conjunctions start subordinating, or often called dependent, clauses. They always start clauses, which means there's a subject and a verb, and then this word before it, whichever word you want to pick, we'll just say SC for subordinating conjunction, makes this whole thing dependent, which means if it was by itself, mm -hmm. it would be a fragment, right? And we wanna teach our students not to write in fragments. We say, don't write a fragment. It doesn't have a complete thought, right? But a complete thought, if you really think about it, is more of an abstract concept. Right? What is a complete thought? Well, it's all there. What is not a complete thought? It's not all there. Do you see how a first, second, third, fourth grader, that may not make total sense to them, right? But they can memorize 21 words and you can teach them if you see this word plus a subject plus a verb, it is a dependent clause every single time. Now that is concrete, that is not abstract. Right. Now, moving on, because I said this had to do with commas. The rule is, if you have DC and then IC, well, what's an IC? Well, that's just, IC is just subject plus verb. They can recognize those, right? If you have DC and IC, you always, Always, and again, those of you who teach English, we don't like exceptions, right? It's terrible to have to teach the kids all the exceptions. There's no exception. Always put a comma, every single time. And then, this is the, this is the proverbial because, guys. If it's IC and then DC, even if it starts with because, I went to the store because I had to buy bread, guess what? Never, ever, ever, 100% of the time. Kids love when there's no exception. Yes. When it always follows the rule, they love it. Okay, now, look at this. You never have to say, Miss, Mrs. So-and-so, Mr. So-and-so, do I have to put a comma here? Should I put a comma before because or after because? Well, where have them look at. So this is why I do it. So notice there's a reason, there's a why. And let me go ahead and give you the chant really quickly. I don't expect you to memorize it in this session. We don't have time, but I would do this every day for a week and by Friday, they would have it memorized. So the first column sounds like this. After although, as, as if, as long as, as soon as, because. Now the as if came from when I taught in California. They loved it in California. It really was just kind of like uh, stairs, blank <laughs> stairs everywhere else, but I've just always kept it. So I'll do that again. After all though, as, as if, as long as, as soon as, because. You join me. After all though, as, as if, as long as, as soon as, because. Okay, we're one third of the way done. Then we do the next column. Before, if, in order that sense, so that, than though. Now, I said than like that before I moved to Texas. The reason I say it like that is because it's not then, okay? Than, so no matter where you go back of our 22 states in the country, you say than and you make your kids do it too. Okay, join me please. Before, if, in order that, since, so that, than though. Last column goes like this. Unless, until, when, whenever, where, wherever, while. I do when, whenever, where, wherever like that for whimsy. There's no other reason, okay? Join me please. Unless, until, when, whenever, where, wherever, while. We would review this Monday, Tuesday, 
Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I usually would do it before I taught the DCIC system. And by then they'd know that I had a reason. So they trust me and we'd go through it. So subordinating conjunctions, and again, chance with or without music, it's not just for the little ones. I mean, the little ones eat it up, but really I did this with high schoolers and they ate it up too. And their writing got better. All right. Repetition catechesis is also a grammar level tool that we have. Now, catechesis, maybe I'll go back for a minute. We usually think of that as the catechism, right? The six chief parts. How can we use the six chief parts in our teaching of our daily lesson plans? But catechesis actually means, it's, it's an educational word. I know we associate with Lutheran theology, and we should, but when Luther picked that for his catechism, he was telling us how to teach the faith to children. So, Kata means after, and eche means sound. So in catechesis, students sound after or echo after to learn word for word, which is why Luther said in his preface, don't change the words. Keep it word for word. And since then, we've changed it. Yes. Pastor Gaub, how many times? Three, four, five. Yeah, it's just, yeah. But he said, don't change the words because he wrote them in a simple way for students or children to echo after their parents, their head of the household, to learn the catechism. So this is an educational method, all right? So repetition and catechesis. This works very well for definitions, rules, and vocabulary, especially things that are very nuanced and you want to be kept kind of in a word for word or specific mm -hmm. way, okay? Finally, we have mnemonic devices. These are great when word for word is not necessary. So I'm gonna give you a stacking example. And mnemonic devices are um, any time that we can connect either something visual or something audible with what we're trying to memorize, kind of to link it, if, if you will, to put it more firmly in our memory. Okay, so um, first I want you guys to picture a plate and you guys can hold the plate. It's kind of helpful if you interact. <laughs> so hold the plate and you look on the bottom and it's a plate made by Della. So you have a plate made by Della. Good. On top of this plate made by Della, you have a pencil. So we have a pencil on a plate made by Della. Good. On top of the pencil on a plate made by Della, we have a New Jersey cow. So you have a plate made by Della, and on top of that, we stack a pencil, and on top of that, we have a Jersey cow, right. Uh, then on top of the Jersey cow, sitting very proud and stoic is King George. So you have a plate made by Della and a pencil and a Jersey cow and King George. Right. And on King George is a big cut. So you have a plate made by Della and a pencil and a Jersey cow and King George with a big cut. Right. And it doesn't have to be big. So just cut. Okay, next we have um, King George and he sneezes and he says, uh, chew. So we have a plate made by Della and a pencil and a Jersey cow and King George with a cut says, uh, chew. Good. Next, after King George does that, we have sitting on top of King George, Mary, oh, actually, let's put him on his nose. Okay. Mary, Queen of Scots, okay. right here on his nose where he said at you. Okay, so we have a plate hey, hey, made hey, by hey, Dalla and, and a pencil, pencil and a jersey cow and George with a and Mary, Queen, Queen of Scots. Scots. Good. Um, on Mary, Queen of Scots, on her head, is a weather vane pointing south. I was going to figure out which way south is. I'm real, let's see. Help me. Thank you. South. Thank you. All right. So we have a made by Della and a pencil and a and with a cut. Is that you? with Mary, Mary Queen, Queen of Scots and a weather vane pointing south. Um, on the weather vane pointing south is a New Hampshire ham. 
Actually, I should just say ham. Let's just say ham. Okay. Yeah. So we have ham right here. So we have a plate made by Della and a pencil and a Jersey cow and King George with a cut. A uh, chew with Mary Queen of Scots and a weather vane pointing south and a ham. Good. On top of the ham, we turn it upside down. It says Virginia. It must be a Virginia baked ham. Okay, so we have a plate made by Della and a pencil and a Jersey cow. And King George with a cut says a chew. And Mary Queen of Scots with a weather vane pointing south. And the ham stamped Virginia. Good. On top of this ham stamped Virginia is a York peppermint patty. <laughs> So we're almost done. We have a plate made by Della and a pencil and a Jersey cow and King George and the cut and a chew with Mary Queen of Scots and a weather vane pointing south and a ham stamped Virginia with a York peppermint patty. Two more, but let's stop there for a minute. Does anyone know what we're doing? No. Colonies. Colonies what? In order of what? When they, when they, when they, when they joined the yeah. union, when they signed the constitution, right? And I stopped right there because those 11, because the nine, uh, nine, 10 and 11 happened within days of each other. And you actually needed nine to sign on to form the union. So um, we say that those 11 really were the first United States. Okay, um, but then we also have, I'll go ahead and give you the last two for the sake of time. After the York peppermint patty, you have a weather vane pointing north, and then you have the Rhode Island red rooster on the very, very top. So let's see if without going through the mnemonic devices, let's see if you can name, I know we don't have dates, that's next, right? But let's see if we can name the 13 colonies to ratify the constitution in order. First was the plate made by Della. Delaware, Delaware Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, mm -hmm. King George, Georgia. 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 Um, Good. Achoo. Good. <laughs> Mary, <laughs> Maryland, <laughs> weather vane pointing South, South Carolina, Carolina with the Ham, New Hampshire, New Hampshire Virginia. Virginia. North oh, sorry. There's a sorry peppermint patty. Oh, yeah. York, Pep New York. York. Weather vane pointing north. North, north Carolina. Carolina. Red rooster. Rhode, Rhode Island. Island. Red rooster. Yes. So, okay. Um, so that's an example of mnemonic devices. Um, I didn't bring it with me, but there's also, there are several um, books, volumes you can get at any kind of bookstore called vocabulary cartoons. The concept there is they take a silly cartoon they take a vocabulary word, they pull almost all of them from the SAT. So this is for older students where if you're working on specific vocabulary to do SAT preparation or just to give them great words to use for writing. Um, and they, so they give them a word, then they give them a link. Um, bulwark is one of the words, which does anybody know what bulwark is? It's in one of our hymns too. Um, it means a wall, like a like a security or a border wall. It's a line of defense. And the link is bulls at work. So there's this cartoon of these bulls in little army helmets building this bulwark. And underneath is a caption that say, the bulls at work build a bulwark. So there's a connection between the link and the visual image and the word and the definition. And I was amazed that some of my kids that really struggled with vocabulary really glommed onto this. So um, some words of it, words of kind of warning on this one. It's not a classical piece, right? It's not a classical book. There are some, in my opinion, um, cartoons that are too scantily clad for my taste or, you know, just different things like that. Um, also, the grammar is horrible. So I would have to go through and sometimes they had fragments with periods and they missed commas and places. So I would actually edit them. But the concept is good. And if you have someone who is an artist in your school or if you are an artist and you can create these things, these are mnemonic devices. The first one, we didn't really have a visual. It was more of like a mental picture. And the second one is an actual visual, but just ways that we can trigger our memory to remember things. Okay, let's move on to logic tools. 
We use these tools regularly for students in grades five through 10. Remember my caveat about that's not an absolute grade level, okay? We use these tools for all students when they ask why or how. Now, I do wanna emphasize a little bit that when a student, especially young ones, I have a five and seven year old right now, I think their words were mama, dada, and why. I mean, I think that was the order, right? So they come out asking why really early and sometimes they actually mean why, right? They wanna know. And sometimes they just mean, I wanna argue with you, I don't like this. It can mean other things. But when your students actually are asking why or how, regardless of their age, they are asking for some sort of logical connection. Logic tools help us as teachers to organize materials and teach process. So again, if you think about that toolbox, when we want to organize materials for our students and show them connections and teach cause and effect and teach this, then this, and so forth, we want a logic tool. Unit and lesson plan FOCI when using logic tools should be on cause and effect, effect excuse me, connections complete, uh, between concepts and the whys and hows of subjects. Okay, now even in my, this list here, which you could have grammar level kids doing, they're gonna eventually wanna know why they're memorizing this and you're gonna wanna tell them and that is using a logic tool, okay? So there is overlap and we do go into our box for multiple tools as teachers. Okay, some logic tools that we have at our disposal as classical Lutheran educators, Socratic method. Using the original definition Socratic method is a form of inquiry. In other words, we ask questions. Engaging a student in a series of those questions and answers to discover truth, usually through an indirect method leading to a contradiction that proves the original premise false. In other words, we start by kind of arguing for the opposite but we don't ever argue, we ask a question mm -hmm. and they answer it and then we ask another question and then they answer it. And these are not just random questions and we're not trying to stump them. What we're trying to do is lead them to a contradiction. And once we get to the contradiction, we say, oh, well, that didn't work. Mm -hmm. Well, then what was our original thing that we said? That's called the premise. What was our original premise? Well, then that must be false. Well, if it's false, then the opposite of that premise is true. Right? And so it's a, pro, it's a proven method through um, indirect um, questioning. Now, it has been expanded over the years as a tool to include both direct and indirect discovery of truth through question and answer. So an example of direct method, by the way, the Shirley is an example of direct method also, but I'm gonna give you another one really quickly. All right, so a direct method we are going to do 2x plus 3 equals 4x minus 7. Now, the Shirley one is a great grammar level one. This is actually a logic level uh, direct method. So um, I will ask the questions and you guys can answer and we're going to solve this equation through direct method, Socratic method, okay? Is my variable on one side or two sides of the equation? Good. Which term, and by the way, some of these things I'm saying would be things you've already defined, right? Because we start at the beginning with grammar. Okay. Which term should I move first? Okay, but we, we just asked about the variable. So which term of the variables should I move? Should I move the 2x over here? Or should I move the 4x over here? So I'm gonna ask again, uh, which term should I move? 2x. 2x. How should I move it? Like what operation? Subtraction. Subtraction, very good. So we do minus 2x, minus 2x. All right, then I would ask my students, what are the three questions to ask? Now, you don't know what the three questions to ask are because I haven't taught you yet. But they would know that the three questions I teach them when we get a variable on one, on one side with things attached, equaling a number on the other, we ask, what is attached to my variable? How is it attached? How do I move it to the other side? So kind of like Shirley has a series of questions and then answers, I would teach my students questions and answers. So they would say, what is attached to my variable? Two and seven. Which do we do first? Seven. How do I move it? Addition. 
Then they would say the three questions again. What is attached to my variable? Two. Two. How is it attached? Well, Multiplication. Two. How do I move it to the other side? Division. And through direct Socratic method, question and answer, they would learn to solve equations. Okay. Um, now let me give you an example of indirect. Does an evolutionist believe in a young Earth creation? No. No. Let's assume this presence, uh, premise, excuse me. The Earth is billions of years old. Everybody assume that premise, okay? We're assuming that, yes. If the Earth is billions of years old, then the universe must also be what? Billions of years old. If the universe is billions of years old, then have our solar system and other galaxies likewise been in space for billions of years? Yes. Uh, is our solar system expanding or contracting over time in space? Expanding. And has there been any evidence of this process reversing or fluctuating over the time it has been measured? No. And if we were to reverse the process of time, that is go back in time, what should the solar system be doing instead of expanding? Contracting. contracting, okay? And is there enough distance between the sun and the earth for this contracting of our solar system to allow this process to continue over billions of years and still promote life to exist on earth? No, no. <laughs> no. right. At this point, and this is an example, so we could say, okay, that our original premise was false and it must not be billions of years old. But the other thing you can do, which is really nice, is at this point, you can have them do their research. Mm -hmm. How far is it from the sun to the earth? How far is it from the earth to the moon? How old supposedly do they say the moon is and the earth? How, uh, what is the rate of, of change between the earth and the moon or between the earth and the sun? How many years max could it possibly be just using this method of kind of, of, of shrinkage, if you will, okay? So these are all things that you can calculate scientifically, but we start with an indirect method of inquiry. Okay, uh, next, teaching questions to ask answer. Mm -hmm. When we have students memorize a question answer flow like Shirley grammar, we are combining grammar and logic level tools. We are also teaching a way to seek knowledge, asking the right questions to obtain the correct answers. The more you use Socratic method and help your students start to do the same, the more we prepare students with the tools to learn independently. It is very important, I'm sorry, that's, I forgot to erase. It's very important to not only use Socratic method, but also to teach your students how to use it as they get older, okay? And they will actually, they'll pick some of that up. They're like, I bet your next question is gonna be da 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 da, right? And they'll be right. Okay, rhetoric tools. We use these tools regularly for students in high school. Again, same caveat. But we use these tools for all students as they express new thoughts, original interpretation, or creative expression. Rhetoric tools help us as teachers to help students express themselves eloquently, persuasively, and effectively. So often it seems that our society wants to put a period right there. We just want our students to express themselves, but we don't. We don't want them just to express themselves. Uh, my children are very good at expressing themselves when they throw a tantrum because they're frustrated, but that doesn't mean that I'm like, oh, they're expressing themselves, right? We want to, them, the rhetoric looks at the good, the true, and the beautiful also, right? We want eloquence, persuasiveness, effectiveness, and virtue through it all. Unit and lesson plan folky when using rhetoric tools should be on interpretation, refutation, argumentation, and the creation of new material. So classical rhetoric tools, and um, for those of you in my three-day, we go in more deeply into this. This is just kind of an overview. So there are five divisions. Um, uh, Aristotle sets up five, or Cicero, excuse me, sets up five divisions for us. Invention, arrangement, style, memory, and delivery. We also have Aristotle's three Aristotelian appeals of logos, pathos, and ethos. And Dr. Talman, how many of you went to one of Dr. Talman's this morning, okay, of writing an essay with heart? So he talked about those. Um, we also have writing and oratory using the progymnus mata. 
um, or sometimes it's just called the pro gym. It's a series of exercises. Originally, it was a series of oratorical exercises that students would learn um, in order to uh, become a uh, eloquent speaker, especially for um, debate in the Senate and, um, and in the marketplace. Um, but now we have expanded that to apply it to writing because it works great written as well. Remember that the ancient worlds were oral in nature, right? And we are both an oral, we're actually sometimes even losing that, but we are an oral and written society. So because of that, we can apply it to both. Oops, let me back up, sorry. And again, we don't really have time to go, I mean, you know, Dr. Tomlin could probably talk on any one of these for a year. I mean, you don't have, we don't have time in a 45 minute session, but these are kind of our tools and I encourage you to, to develop your own persuasiveness, eloquence and so forth and look into some of these. There are a lot of great resources out there mm -hmm. uh, between Cicero, Quintilian and Aristotle, just great stuff. Okay, now quadrivium tools, intentionality with numbers. Remember that the quadrivium is arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. And really, um, Boethius said that this can be kind of summarized about everything about numbers. The study of numbers, the study of numbers in space, the study of numbers in time, and the study of numbers in space and time. Ways to incorporate the quadrivium into all subject areas. And I think, let me back up for just a second. Did, was it Dr. Veith that said this morning that we need to be more intentional now that we've really have yeah. the trivium well at hand to go into quadrivium? Yeah. I agree completely. All right, grammar. The difference between ordinal and cardinal numbers. This is one of my pet peeves. <laughs> Can I put you on the spot? Okay. What's your birthday? June 8th. 1961. Yeah, and you didn't have to get the year, but thank you. She said June 8th. That is her birthday, June 8th, right? She is referencing on the calendar which day it is, right? This is, we would never read this June 9th or July 14th, <laughs> right? When we use 9th or 14th, those are ordinal numbers. We could say, she could have said the 8th day of June, but her birthday, not birthday, I know that's not a word, but her birthday <laughs> is June 8th, okay? These are little things, but if we have intentionality with numbers, our students will too. If we get sloppy with numbers, well, let's go back to the trivia. If we're sloppy with grammar and sloppy with our punctuation and sloppy with our spelling, is that good? No, no but why do we be sloppy? We should not be sloppy with numbers either. They also have a, a rule book, if you will. They have a function and definitions of when to use them where. Okay, so there's that. There's um, plurality, right? That's a sing singular and plural, which is, of course, we usually talk about in English, is a number thing. Helping students to see how, whether we communicate with letters and language or numbers, we are communicating. Um, comparative versus superlative adjectives, that's a number thing. Singing jingles, anytime we sing, we're incorporating music, which is some say the highest level of the quadrivium. Science, we use numbers with our measurements, our data in experiments, our using direct and indirect proofs in geometry. Uh, in addition to the scientific method, we see proportion and infinite repetition in nature, helping students see how God creates those, those repetitions in the natural world and through numbers and singing jingles. History, we have dates, numerical facts and figures, studying the great mathematicians and scientists of the past. I hope that in your history classes and your history timelines that you are including as many um, mathematicians and philosophers, natural philosophers and scientists and so forth, as you are including, uh, uh, you know, literary greats and historic figures and so forth, okay? Um, and singing jingles, fine arts, rhythm, counting beats. Obviously, it's full of music itself, but it's full of numbers. Proportion of primary colors to create secondary colors. Mm -hmm. Studying and performing music. Learning proportions of thirds, fourths, fifths, and octaves. Hopefully you're just singing in the fine arts, not singing jingles, right? <laughs> and then finally, theology. 
God's orderly quantified creation. Um, I love talking with students, older students about the concept of infinity. Okay, those are just great things for them to just wrap their minds around. Um, talk to me at break um, about the formula for a sphere and the formula for an area of sphere and the volume of a sphere and how they're related. It's really cool stuff. Okay, and uh, chanting and singing in chapel. Finally, mathematics. This is obvious, no examples needed. Okay, right, we use numbers all the time. But you know, we use, we use words like, think about a math textbook or a math book or a math worksheet. Yeah, of course there are numbers on it, right? But what else are on there? Words, we always have words on there, don't we? Right? Let's make sure that we have at least as many numbers in our language things as we have language things in our numbers things, right? And that will help to, to show students that we value and lift up the quadrivium. It's not all trivium. All right. So let's talk about how to put this into your lesson plans. I spent most of the time on purpose talking about tools because this last step is the easy step. Yes. Okay, um, you start with the broadest component of your subject. So that's either a curriculum guide, if you have one, uh, a course plan, a syllabus for the year, whatever it is, okay, overarching. Determine your use of trivium and quadrivium tools based on the subject, really, and also the content, like where you are in the subject, and the student's age or level, okay? So you're gonna be pulling different tools based on all those things. Then purposely define scope of study and sequence of the material, right? Our scope and sequence, that's what our lesson plans are, right? Our unit plans, our course plans, our lesson plans. But we want to purposely define those after we have said, what tools do I need? So when you're sitting down and you're ready to write your lesson plans, you have your invisible toolbox right there. And you say, okay, well, this is what I'm trying to accomplish. These are the things we need to learn this week. These are our objectives. These are the things that my students need to know. What tools will help me do that? And grab them and put them into your lesson plans. Then for each unit, break them down in terms of daily and intentionally add those appropriate trivium and quadrivium tools. I like to label my tools GLR, and then you can also do Q for quadrivium, okay? So that, so that you can remind yourself. Mm -hmm. But if you get used to grabbing those tools all the time, it will become second nature. And if you're thinking about it first, which tools do I need? And then plugging them in, you don't even have to label them after a while. And how do I do this? How do I write it out? Okay, it, any way you yeah. want, okay? You can do this in a lesson plan book, typed on computer sheets of paper. It can be handwritten. You can use sticky notes. I mean, whatever it is that, however you've been writing down your lesson plans, okay? You can't just tell your principal, mm -hmm. it's all up here, okay? You have to write them down somehow. But however it is that you've normally been writing them down, right? There's not a classical book out there where you open it up and somehow it's organized classically versus progressively. It's, you know, just write it down and be intentional. And this is an important part, have regular reviews with fellow teachers and your headmaster. Um, if you're a homeschooler, fellow homeschool educators or yourself, that conversation is a bit interesting, but you can do it that way, to analyze the classical components of your plans. Don't just be satisfied with, well, I think I put enough in. Bounce it off your fellow teachers, especially those teaching above your grade level and below your grade level. They may have other ideas, right? All right, so we have one minute left. So unfortunately, we don't have too much time for comments and questions, but we have one minute, so let's use it. Questions, comments, thoughts, any discussion? Yes. Um, I would like to suggest um, that we somehow have a tool. Uh, okay, so at my school, we have a book full of chants and jingles that some of you give us already. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes I write ones that are ones. So I add to them, and it would be nice if we have some way of sharing that. You know. Well, yeah, and actually there are several, it's not perfect, but we do have several Facebook groups if you're on Facebook. We also have a kind of 
e it's not as widely used because a lot of us are on Facebook. But for those of you who aren't on Facebook, if you go through our through our website itself, there are different groups, and one is Classical Lutheran Educators. So you can either post it there as like a group discussion. I think it's through Google, or um, the the better place to share it would be on one of our Facebook pages. Yeah, because we have a we have a homeschool group, and then I think we have a day school educator group. But great, great suggestion. I'm sure, you, I'm sure you guys are already doing a lot of this. It's just about being intentional and consistent and not, and every time, I mean, how many of you have taught the class, whatever class you're doing, more than one year? <laughs> Almost all of us, right? So let's not be satisfied with the tools we've already used. Let's, let's grab more or put more or, um, you know, and keep using them and, and, and finding newer and better ways to do this. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.